asking him why you're turning there. A couple of days, Karen shared last day with us. Karen and I gave her on behalf of the congregation a copy of all trips to Morning Mercy. Very gospel. That's right. I read that together ourselves, so I told Karen. I'll yes, and Karen, I'll be Pray that God will sexually life. Also, uh, yesterday, Pelly faded in a bait tournament. I guess. Her team, only a couple, that won both debates, positive and negative. Encouraged by that and proud of her for that, Pelly. That's by an accomplishment. I took debate in her. And you now needing to. At the end of our service today, we'll have a brief for our folks, kids, and bring a brief financial report that's a very encouraging thing. That from Brother. Our ladies went to Falls Creek because you know, our ladies were able to, Ed Karen and I were able to watch the live stream. Computers Friday night. That's available online. We'll let Sorry, a story. Her curse. Miraculously rescued. First Corinthians 15, we are in this marvelous section. Entire chapter 58, dedicated to the resurrection of Christ. In the season, where the reality of that is heightened. Today in the church calendar for many churches around the world that, that Follow the liturgical calendar. This is Palm Sunday. This is the day before Good Friday, fiction of the first day of the week, the morning. So we're reading today 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 to 34, looking for the second time at this passage. Stand with me, would follow along. I read this. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority, power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is, ex he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him, who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, but my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with bears at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right. Do not go on sin. Some have no knowledge of God. I say this. 
We just read together the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord take this today and help us understand perhaps some things we haven't understood in the passage, but enlarge our capacity to celebrate the reality of the bodily resurrection, to strengthen our resolve, to live daily as if we really believe that the tomb is empty. We indeed have been saved by grace through faith. Thank you. I told you last week that this, these uh, 34 verses break down into uh, four considerations, I believe. First, the reality of the resurrection and the Redeemer, verses 20 to 22. We looked at that last week. Then the reality of the resurrection and the redeemed. The reality of the resurrection and the restoration of Reality of the resurrection, ending incentives, provocation. Let's look at this today, see how far we can go. First of all, we said last week that we read Romans 5 as our responsive reading, 12 to 21 last week. The idea that uh, reality that Christ has been the first fruits. We talked about first fruits last week. The idea that if you if you plant a garden, you go out and you see first a little green tomato, perhaps, and that green tomato grows and turns red. The, the first one to get there, the garden, is your first fruits. It's the, the idea that there will be more tomatoes to follow. And the idea in the scripture was the first fruits was always offered to the priests, expression and recognition that we know that God has allowed this. Well, Jesus Christ is that in the resurrection. He's God's token of genuine resolve and, and commitment that all who die in the Lord will be raised. Proof being Jesus has come bodily from the grave. We looked at that last week and said what Paul is beginning to teach here, and you'll see it more obviously, is, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not simply an isolated reality, an isolated, miraculous blessing. It is, it is that and more. It is the token of God saying, because he lives, you too shall live. And Jesus says that in the Revelation, the very thing. And so these early verses tell us that by, one, by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection. And then he makes this statement. I wanted to read today so we, verse 22, so we can get into verse 23. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. When you were born, you were born dead in trespasses and sins. In Adam all died. Lisa Turkhurst did a great job talking about life between two gardens, the Garden of Eden. Garden of Paradise, the new heaven and the new earth. Lord. Fall came in Adam. It affected not only Adam and Eve, it affected all their offspring. You and I are in that group. We were born dead in our trespasses and sin. And Adam all die. And so this big circle, all in Adam. Then there's another circle, all in Christ. The challenge for every son of Adam, every daughter of Eve, everyone listening to my voice, everyone you talk with and encounter every day is to get out of Adam and into Christ. And the only way you make that bridge is repenting of sin and trusting in Christ. And if you've not done that, then you are still in Adam. You're dead in your trespasses. And sin. See, the next section here talks about, verse 23, puts the, puts the qualifier around this. Because some people would read that and say, well, everybody died in Adam, everybody's going to be alive in Christ. No, 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 read it honestly. There's the reality not only of the Redeemer, but of the redeemed in verse 23. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, there's that term again, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. All are born in Adam. All need to get into Christ. 
But the only people in Christ are those who belong to Christ. We told you last week, or when we've looked at, at the word when it comes up in the scriptures, belong is the idea of long to be. Long to be. Do you long to be with Christ? Do you long to be like Christ? Do you long to know the Apostle Paul who wrote half the New Testament says toward the end of his life that I may know him. Oh, don't you, don't you know him? Haven't you trusted in Jesus Christ? Yes. Yes. For Christ, I count every accolade that's ever been bestowed upon me as a pile of dung. Oh, I want to know. You see, if you're one of those people who say you came to know Christ X days, months, years ago, and you don't have beating in you right now, the longing to know Him more, the longing to go deeper with Christ, the longing to be made more like Christ, the longing to love Christ and love what Christ loves, chief among that being the church, something wrong. At his long. All who remain in Adam will face first death, second death. The eternal damnation, separation from God, cast eternal hell. Where they will suffer not with the devil. If you think the devil rules hell, you hadn't read the scripture very well. You will suffer with hell. God rules hell. One writer said, part of the hellishness of hell will be to, to live in eternal torment before the face of God. Burned him. All in Adam. Born once, die twice. All in Christ, though. All who in this life, while they live, come to repent of their sin and trust in Christ and begin that transformation that Paul calls in 2 Corinthians, moving from glory to glory, that is, being sanctified daily, growing in grace, putting to death sin, loving the brethren more. Another test. Read 1 John sometime. I don't have time to preach John today. Read 1 John sometime. There's a, he puts these tests before you. If you say this, but this, why? That you love God, don't love brethren. He, he just, he faults hard in your mind. Paul is setting this before us here, each in his own turn. Do you have hope today that the resurrected Christ, who is coming again, will come for you? Take you home to be because you belong to him, because you long to be, because you long to be. Then he goes on and says in the third portion here the reality of the resurrection and the restoration, verses 24 28. Then comes the end. And so he's, he's talking about Christ the first fruits, those who belong to him at his coming. And, and if, what he seems to be saying here is there's this resurrection, which is the, uh, is the first resurrection, Jesus Christ. Then there's the final resurrection, who belong to Christ. The end. We looked at the, what I believe is the biblical sequence of Revelation, I'll not do that again here. Focus rather on the victory. Victory. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule, every authority, power. Paul says in Romans, in you are more than nothing shall separate us. Coming back. 
probably sooner than me. Like to meet. He will put on every. Let leadership in a talk. Let let people speak of a Christian advocating hate. They will be crushed. Let Islam set forth its false god. Islam will be crushed. Let Buddhism play its peaceful fakery. It will be crushed. Let secularism rule the day. Let, let America say today, as a poll came out this week, no religion at all. Dominant answer in America will be crushed under the feet of King Jesus coming back, taking no Coming back for his own to vindicate you, vindicate me, to vindicate the martyrs. And vindicate the martyrs coming back. The end. It will be a victorious end for all who trust him. Do not fret. Do not fret when people in Congress do all sorts of venom about you and me and our God and our Savior and our Bible. Don't fret. Don't fret. Pray that they will repent. But if they do not repent, they will be crushed by the Lamb who has become the Lion. Inevitable. Inevitable. Every rule, every authority and power. If you've read Pilgrim's Progress and you've benefited from it, of course, the, the movie is coming out, I think it's this, this week. You ought to see it if you get the opportunity. If you've read Pilgrim's Progress, I encourage you to read Holy War by John Bunyan. It is, it would be the very best book in English, best allegory in English ever written, except for one thing, Pilgrim's Progress. Subtitled, The Losing and Taking Again of the Town of Man. Brilliant. Brilliant. Read that. Get the sense of how, how disgusting, faking God is. How exciting, stimulating, conquering Emmanuel. So here it is. Verse 25, He must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. There's a picture here that is drawn from the world uh, that Paul lived in. When a conquering general come back, uh, there were several things you could anticipate in the procession, depending on how the battle went. If they were able to capture the foreign leader, they would drag him tied around the throat behind the chariot of the conquering general. They would go just fast enough that he was just barely able to keep it. stumble, perhaps get up. They would also cut off his thumbs off his thumbs, he could never hold a sword again. And then when they brought him into the center point palace of the city, general, take this conquered general, put him at the feet of the king. The king would sit there. And the general would at least be positionally, visually beneath the feet of the king. But sometimes, King would stand up, walk, but that's the picture. He will put his enemies under his feet. Whatever you think about the end time, whatever you think about the what Armageddon me, I promise you, in the face of King Jesus, it will not be conquer. Absolutely. Be sure we're loving the object. All the other objects are not worthy of the love of a son of Adam. will be under the heel. Then the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Verse 26, how many of us here, perhaps even recently, have had that, that wicked reality break into it? A loved one, kinsman, neighbor.
so you can bump into someone at a Walmart, around to a alley, shadow of be around living people, not able to cope. If Jesus tarries long enough, folks, any of us in this place will face the cause of the resurrection of Jesus. Death is a death. One day, he returns, putting all his enemies under his feet. He will vanquish. John Owen's great work. I encourage you to read it. I think he was writing it for 20 years. Read it out loud. Death of death. Death of Christ. Think about it. Death. Verse 27, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. When it says all things are put in subjection, it's plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. Like this is get lost in the pronouns. God has given. God has made him king of kings. God has raised him from the dead, proving that nothing. So Jesus, going forth conquering and to conquer, is gathering up his own, slaying his enemies. When the end comes, the Father. Jesus talked about it in John. All that the Father gives me will come to me. He's, he's recognizing that he's been given a gift by the Father. When the time comes, he will give those back to me. It says all things are put in subjection. It's plain that he is accepted who put all things. God will not be rejected. Found in subjection. Anyone. Only anybody blow smoke at you. Well, whether it's God or Allah or, or Vishnu, that, that matters. Jehovah. He demands and tells us how we relate. We don't get to pick how we relate. We don't get to say, well, I'm just going to get a bunch of pinwheels, have those spinning, and have a bunch of flags flying across. And when the, when the wind blows the flags, that we're just going to pray five times a day, going to keep my, my shawl with me, and we're going to put everybody else to the sword in the net. No. There is one God, Jehovah. Is his prophet, priest, king, his son. All things are coming. Objection. Look at 28. When all things are subjected to him, then the son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. I like this here. Jesus offers his treasure to God. I get this picture of the sun bowing. Final act as Redeemer. Think of this. To offer all of the redeemed, all of the ages, through God the Father. Then he takes his place. Royal place. Try unity. It's always been. Came the Son, he 
lowered himself even. When he finally offers all of the redeemed to the house. Here, Father, are all of those you gave me. I have not lost one of all that you have given me. I give them. Come, my Why is Paul telling us this? He says, those coming realities ensure that the resurrection goes beyond Jesus himself and to those who die in Jesus because Jesus has a love gift to the Father. That's you and me. And if, and if the dead are not raised, then there is no resurrected love gift to give to the Father. Think about how the reality of the resurrection folks are nine to thirty. Otherwise, why do people mean what do people mean by being baptized? If the dead are not raised at all. Why are people baptized? On He's getting down to the nitty gritty here. There are people in Corinth dying. They may even affirm that Jesus rose. They're denying that any of them will rise. The people who've already died, they're denying they're going to rise. I'll deal with this verse first. This is one of the most difficult verses probably in all. Mormons have a business built on them. Like in Catholicism, you can say prayers and give, give money, buy your party to love one. These from purgatory or shorten their time in purgatory. Mormonism, you can come and be baptized for the if they have not been baptized. Therefore, they, they now have a part in the rest. Folks, this is a difficult passage. Whatever Paul is meaning, he is not meaning anything remotely. Part of the challenge comes in the preposition here. Why are people baptized only? That preposition can be rendered, is rendered 12 different ways. We'll read, read about a dozen different approaches. Some will say, seems like there was some phenomena going on in Corinth where people wrongheadedly being baptized for the dead thinking somehow that those who had died before, they were, maybe they'd confessed faith in Christ and weren't baptized. They were doing this in hopes of completion. Paul didn't teach. Where would they get that? Paul did not teach baptismal salvation. He did not teach that, that immersion is necessary for salvation. You may have Church of Christ friends who teach that, but it's erroneous because it assaults the gospel. It assaults the sufficiency of the saving work of Jesus Christ. If a person must be saved by grace through faith in Jesus and take the wafer, be baptized, church of Christ, speak in tongues, charismatic, then you have undermined the sufficiency of the work of Jesus Christ. You can't sing Jesus is all I need. I need to be baptized too. I need to tongues to I need to take communion to be so that is not what is being taught here John MacArthur makes a strong case I think for the for the preposition speaking of folks who are being baptized and he's right when he went even first Corinthians that being baptized in the New Testament was nearly synonymous with professing faith in Christ in other words, they did not have a time of lingering like we do sometimes. Because you see, when in, in Paul's day, if you were going to be baptized in the triune name, immersed, first of all, most of the opportunities for that were public. 
You were going to be identifying and making a break with, if you were a Gentile, making a break with the, with the multiplicity of the gods of paganism. You were making a clean break to say, I am rejecting this, my pagan upbringing, and I am following Christ. Near simultaneous. If you were a Jew, you were rejecting Judaism because you were not participating in proselyte baptism. You were being baptized in the triune name. And coming out of a Judaistic family, you were a blasphemer to consider that God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The point being that you were making such a clean and obvious break from your culture and your upbringing that nobody would do that knowingly because of what it was going to cost. came from an Orthodox Jewish home. The very least they would do to you, they would have a funeral for you. The family would plan a funeral procession, go lead along as, and, as bury you dead to them. If you were a pagan and the Romans got a hold of you, you could be charged with atheism. How's that? Because you rejected all their gods to follow what they imagined to be a false god. Atheist. So, I think MacArthur is on to something here. He says that, that the idea of being baptized in view of the witness of the dead. In other words, Paul says, if there's no resurrection, why would people go through that powerful symbol, that culture breaking, turning your back on your world symbol, responds to the witness of others because of what the symbol portrays, death, burial, resurrection. That is not. Why would they go through that? It would cost them too much. By the way, it still costs people today in different places. You remember when Gatana Gatana came here and told about the converts that were baptizing in the dark? Russian authorities came up on them on horseback, coming out of the water, said, recant. Recant Christ. Said, we will not. Got and killed every convert, pastor, and for cost, some place. Culture. So I really believe that's what's going on here. So we don't get bogged down in some, some ritual that would make no sense in the aftermath of Paul's teaching. It would have to have been something imported in from pagan ritual. And the commentaries I've read said, I'm not sure we know. There's no resurrection. Why are people baptized? Public testimony, faith in Christ, symbol of do this because of the witness of those who have gone on. Why are we in danger every hour? He said. Why? Why am I risking what I'm risking if if you will not be raised, if I will not be raised? I protest, brothers. I'm troubled. I, I'm opposing. Some of the teaching going on in Corinth that says that while Christ may have been raised from the grave, we don't have any prospect of being. If we die, that's it. By my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. I want you to know it's, it, is, it is because of who Christ is and what he's done for me and my hope of what he's doing in you and will do for you that I face death every day. Jesus' life was one of continual self denial. Paul manifesting. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? Commentators will tell you that either he perhaps did fight with wild beasts, or he's using that that picture of the of the leaders in Ephesus who wanted to have him killed, have him torn apart. Fought with wild beasts at Ephesus. If the dead are not raised. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. He said what we ought to be doing is shifting our emphasis, declaring that Jesus died and rose again, and then party like it's 2,000. It's not going to matter. We can, in fact, we can trust in Christ, and he's, he's going after an attitude there. 
and you see it picked up in the Marcion, that the body is evil, the spirit is good. So the best thing that can happen to the body, to the spirit, is to be released from the body. And so for, the, for that mindset, the idea for them that, that the spirit could be released and then joined again to an evil body, repugnant. Why would I want to have my body back if it's, if it's sinful? By the way, this was, there were two schools of thought, you can imagine. One was, so just trust in Jesus with your heart. It doesn't matter what you do with your body. Your body's wicked anyway. So they could justify immorality. They could justify debauchery. That's just what the body does. Paul's going after that. Some think he's quoting them. Let us eat and drink. Die. If there's no resurrection, then that's what's ahead for us. We're going to die. That's it. So just party. Eat, drink. Then he says, do not be deceived. Don't let people convince you. Don't let people convince you, boys and girls, folks, you, you're around the world, you're growing up. There's nothing after. That's what the devil wants you to love for you. He would love for you who are adults. Uh, I get so wound up about it. I have my truth. My truth. Bad company. Really trouble. He's been troubled the whole letter, you know. Hung with us this far. All the mess going. Don't hang around these. People. Don't let these people. In. Don't let these folks who are telling you that there is no resurrection have an impact on you, because you you take your eye off the prize. Paul says, Philippians, I press toward the toward the goal." Prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus, my Lord. I'm, I'm running to finish the race. I'm not going to relax. I'll tell you something, folks. There's a, there's a functional. People get to a certain point and, and live. Live as if you really believe the tomb is still empty. As if we just got word this morning. Before we gather, some messenger runs in here and says, guess what? I just got back from a place where they believe Jesus was. I an update for you. Tomb. Bad company. Oops. Good more. The application of that is many. Here. About hanging out with them. Resurrect. Wake up from your drunken stupor. They weren't necessarily having too much to drink. That's possible. But he says, what you're, what you're allowing yourself to embrace, drunk and not alert. Right. Be like those Ephesians. Stop being drunk with wine. Keep. Do not go on sin. An idea rose from the grave, but we sin. Sinful, dangerous, and detrimental. I off. Then he says, some have. this to you. What is shameful? What is shameful? That the church at Corinth, like many churches, allow people to continue in their members, demonstrate lack. They live just maybe more. They live their own way. Nobody tells them 
They don't support you. Their own thing, go their own way. These were not outright atheists in Corinth telling them. These were people who were members of the church in Corinth. Fine. We must fight. Maintain integrity and membership. Only those who evidence of born again, saved by aftermath. Following him in vital union. Walking in a covenantal relationship. Otherwise, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. One person, half hearted person, can touching up. You know what it looks like? Abnormal. Warns the church. Warn one another. Not only to, quote, believe that Christ rose and that we too will rise, but to live believe, live resurrected, live transformed. Challenge to Resurrected king, resurrecting Your Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. Lord, we believe. Help us when we demonstrate what we look like. Help us when we respond to providences, circumstances. Salts of the world of flesh. Face those challenges singing in our cause he lives, I can. He lives, all fear is gone. Eve says, because I live. When he says that those who have been born twice will only taste death, we will rise. Deliver us. Stand and sing.